Well, thank you, Fred. Uh, let me also say good morning and welcome you to today's event. Uh, at Brookings, we are delighted to be co-sponsoring co this with the Peterson Institute and with the Atlantic Council. And uh, we're also delighted with the turnout. Uh, I think you're going to find that we have a very interesting set of discussions. Uh, I would like to recognize a couple of people uh, in particular, uh, His Excellency Ambassador Alexander Motsik and also, and also Ambassador at Lodge Alexander Sherba from Ukraine. And let me just briefly introduce what we hope to cover today. Uh, 16 months ago in March of 2010, after what observers regarded as a free and fair election, Viktor Yanukovych became president of Ukraine. Since then, there has been an increasing debate about the state and quality of governance within Ukraine. And that debate is taking place in Ukraine, it's taking place in Europe, and it's taking place here on this side of the Atlantic in the United States. Critics, independent observers, and in some cases, Western diplomats have expressed concern that democracy in Ukraine is backsliding, that the political space that was developed in the previous 15 years is now somehow becoming more restricted. And as evidence of this, they cite things such as pressure on the media, they cite the October t uh, 2010 local elections, which didn't meet the standards of the national elections conducted in the previous five years. They cite inappropriate activities by the Security Service of Ukraine, corruption, and also the selective prosecution of key opposition political figures, most prominently former Prime Minister Yulia Tymoshenko. In 2005, Ukraine became the first post-Soviet state other than the Baltic states to achieve a ranking of fully free from Freedom House. Earlier this year, Ukraine became the first post-Soviet state to lose that ranking. Now on the other side, President Yanukovych and his government say that they are not retreating on democracy, that they are not abusing citizens' rights. They argue that centralizing some power and authority in Ukraine is necessary for effective governance, and that it's also necessary to push through the sorts of reform that Ukraine needs. They also assert that they are implementing Ukraine's laws in a fair and unbiased manner. So what we want to do today is explore two questions. You know, what is the state of governance within Ukraine? And then second, how is that affecting the economy, decisions by foreign investors, and how does that reflect Kyiv's foreign relations? In order to do this, we've assembled two panels which we believe reflect very diverse viewpoints on these questions. Uh, we're pleased that we have panelists from Kyiv, from Europe and the United States, and we're very grateful for their participation. Before turning to the panels, though, we're first going to hear a perspective from the Ukrainian government. Uh, we're delighted that Deputy Pr Foreign Minister Pavlo Klimkin is with us. And following the second panel, there will be a short break for lunch, after which we'll have our concluding keynote conversation with former National Security Advisor Zbigniew Dzerzhinsky. We've organized this conference to keep prepared remarks to a minimum. We've asked each panelist to speak in their opening comments for no more than five to seven minutes. And Anders and I have discussed this. We've decided to be very brutal with regards to the clock. But we want to do that in order to maintain maximum time for discussion. And that includes discussion with the audience. And we do encourage you to participate fully. And our hope is that this conference, through the discussions, and also perhaps through some argument and debate among the panelists, will shed light on how governance in Ukraine is really doing, and also how that is affecting both the economy in Ukraine and also Ukraine's relations with its key international partners. So without anything further, let me now turn the floor over to Damon Wilson, Executive Vice President of the Atlantic Council, and he's going to introduce and moderate the first discussion with Deputy Foreign Minister Klimkin. Thank you. Thank you very much, Steve, uh, and thank you, Fred and Anders, uh, for hosting this uh, event today at the Peterson Institute. Um, my name is Damon Wilson. I'm, I'm Executive Vice President at the Atlanta Council. Uh, we're pleased at the Council to be a co-sponsor of today's conference on Ukraine, in part because we believe that Ukraine is such an important part of the Atlantic community. And I think today's discussion and today's turnout underscores that there are a lot of people in Washington that share that, that, uh, that belief and have a set of uh, concerns now as well. We're particularly pleased to kick off today with a conversation with uh, Deputy Foreign Minister of Ukraine, Pavel Klimkin. This is a conference about governance in Ukraine and the impact on foreign policy. So it's fitting that we begin with a conversation with, uh, with the minister. Mr. Klimkin has served in the foreign ministry since 1993. Uh, he's had a variety of portfolios ranging from arms control and disarmament, nuclear and energy security, postings in Germany and the United Kingdom, but also, as uh, importantly for today's conversation, worked in the Department for European Integration and served as the director of the EU Department. 
Since 2000 and uh, 2010, Mr. Klimkin has served as a Deputy Foreign Minister where he's continued to be a point person on the negotiations with the European Union, particularly regarding the association agreement, the Deep and Comprehensive Free Trade Agreement. So we wanted to begin our conversation today by, uh, by having a discussion, asking you a question about the connection between what's happening internally in Ukraine in terms of government governance and externally in terms of your foreign policy priorities, particularly with the European <laughs> Union. President Yanukovych has been clear that a closer relationship with Europe, with the European Union, is, a top, is the top foreign policy priority for his administration. And in many respects, this government has made tremendous progress in advancing that agenda, arguably significantly more progress than any other Ukrainian government to date. Uh, you're on track to move forward with, uh, to conclude perhaps by year end, an agreement, uh, an association agreement with the European Union, including a deep and comprehensive free trade agreement. Yet actions at home related to democracy, d uh, governance, are beginning to raise concerns, raise questions, not just in Washington, but in Europe as well. And in many respects have the potential to put at risk, I think, that top foreign policy goal of the administration. Uh, as, as Steve alluded to in his opening remarks, uh, supporters of Ukraine and supporters of Ukrainian integration into Europe look at the record and, and are quite concerned, beginning with the local elections in October 2010 that were seen as a step back rather than a step forward in Ukraine's democratic progress. The concerns that are at their height right now about allegations of selective prosecution, particularly surrounding the case of former Prime Minister Yulia Tymoshenko, issues related to the electoral code changes that could tilt the favor uh, the uh, the playing field in favor of the party of regions. These issues have been the topics of conversations between Vice President Biden, President Yanukovych, uh, just yesterday the EU Commissioner for Enlargement and Neighborhood Policy, Stefan Fula, reiterated his concerns about selective uh, justice and political prosecution and the potential impact on talks with the European Union. So I wanted to kick off our conversation today, Mr. Minister, with your understanding of the connection between what happens internally in Ukraine with what Ukraine aspires to in its foreign policy externally. Do Ukrainian politicians understand the connection between the internal actions and external goals? Um, and, and do you see what's happening at Ukraine, uh, in, within Ukraine, as, it, as advancing and strengthening your hand in talks with the European Union? Or is this putting at risk the top foreign policy goal? Please, Mr. Minister. Uh, many thanks, Damon, and uh, many thanks uh, for your kind introduction. Uh, excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, of course I have quite a long speech here, but probably let me just uh, try to map uh, out a couple of points along uh, with what uh, Damon has just said, uh, and it would be great, of course, to engage in a good discussion here. Uh, so. Firstly, of course, let me let me thank you for for such an interest in Ukraine, and uh, I assume that getting such such a great crowd here on Independence uh, Day week is is not easy. So my compliment goes to to organizers, of course, and uh, I do appreciate also personally in the invitation to speak here because it's my first time. Uh, but even more importantly for me, uh, I also take this conference uh, as a good sign that America is interested in Ukraine's uh, path towards democracy, prosperity, and, and stability. It's a key point for me. And actually, my, my first message here is uh, that interest is quite mutual also on our part because Ukraine does need America on, on that path, and especially at the backdrop of comprehensive but rather painful reforms. And uh, it's actually the first time in Ukrainian history that the whole country is to be reshuffled by comprehensive reforms. And exactly because of that, not only, but also because of that, uh, we are interested in, in an honest and constructive Ukrainian-American dialogue. And I, I just enjoy that uh, kind of uh, atmosphere here today. Uh, 
my second point uh, is uh, is of course about understanding Ukraine. You know, practically every week uh, I talk to to new ambassadors coming to uh, uh, to Kiev, also with uh, you know presenting their copies of credentials to me. And uh, my point uh, to them is uh, actually. Uh, Ukraine is never boring, is what I keep saying about Ukraine. Um, and it takes a great deal of patience, you know, and expertise and time to keep up with all surprising twists and nuances of, of Ukrainian politics. And uh, in, 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 in my understanding and also my perception that the uh, United States actually has the patience and expertise. But, uh, of course, uh, the pace and the time is, is a key point here, and uh, United States cannot wait indefinitely for Ukraine's success as democracy and a successful market economy, and neither, neither can Ukraine uh, herself actually. Uh, if, uh, if you take uh, you know, the whole thrust of reforms which are still under planning and uh, under implementation now, it's about 21 key dimensions or 21 key spheres. And uh, for, for everyone who, who is actually following what is going on in Ukraine, to start with quite important tech reforms, and I would say it's, it's, it's working already because uh, the tax collections, uh, you know, went up quite considerably. After that, administrative reform and quite uh, quite painful one. Could you imagine, you know, here in Washington? I'm uh, I'm not trying to draw any kind of parallels here, not at all. But I'm also responsible in the ministry for for different staff issues, and I have now to manage minus 20% cuts in the foreign ministry. And, uh, you know, I have a lot of friends in different foreign ministries around the world. Probably the foreign office in London is also a kind of, uh, you know, sacrifice, uh, sacrifice and exercise with minus 20%. Otherwise, could you imagine State Department cutting now 20% of all the jobs? But it's a, it's a, it's a cross-cutting exercise. It's a cross-cutting exercise to make uh, you know uh, the whole system work effectively and uh, to be to be up to the challenge. And it's only the first stage because after that the administrative reform should come to the local level. And local level, it's exactly the key challenge for Ukraine, because if you take some regional administration, some oblast administration, they are actually bigger than some Ukrainian ministry. So you could imagine you actually the thrust of that and the scope of that. And now we are dealing uh, with, uh, with pension reforms. You know, pension reforms are never easy. Pension reforms are never popular. But in Ukraine, after all years of independence, it's extremely unpopular. But there is a political will, not only behind the pensions reforms, but behind all the reforms there. And we have also education reform, we have also health reform. So practically in the pipeline. So the idea to make a kind of comprehensive reshuffle. And for me, for me also personally, it's it's uh, about two probably rather philosophical issues. The first one about post-Soviet legacy, because uh, we are approaching now the 20th anniversary of our independence. And we are still living uh, somehow also on the basis of the post-Soviet post -Soviet legacy, which, which is still important in Ukraine. It's not a point to break off with, with such a post-Soviet legacy, because the history is there, the mentality is there. But at the end of the day, and it's also a critical point for me, and, and probably my key message, U U Ukraine is a European country. European country not in, in, a, in a purely geographical sense, but uh, uh, from the point of, uh, of Ukrainian history and quite complicated history, I would say from the point of mentality and also 
could I put it from a sense of direction? Because the sense of direction is, uh, is what's so important for Ukrainian reforms. Uh, talking about all kinds of reforms back in Ukraine, I would say that the European perspective and the idea that the future and, of course, ongoing reforms should be based and also framed up along the European standards is also the key idea of meeting criteria for the future membership. And again, for me, it's not about, uh, it, it's not just about membership. Even without membership, such reforms would be extremely important, even crucial for Ukraine. But it's also important to understand that Ukraine belongs to Europe and one day it should, be, it should be a member of the European Union. And for me, it's a point of ensuring Ukraine's security. And we could go a bit deeper into that, uh, you know, in our discussions. For me, again, it's also a security point. For me, it's a point of framing up all democratic reforms in Ukraine. And for me, it's also a point of creating a real market economy. Why? We are negotiating now the new agreement between the European Union and Ukraine. Uh, we've it's, it's, it's under negotiation now for three and a half years, with probably 18 or 19 rounds of negotiations, both on the political part and our free trade agreement. And it's, uh, it's a kind of no wise. It's really innovative agreement, both for Ukraine and the European Union. Why? Because it should put our relations on, on the completely new basis. Not just cooperation, because cooperation is important. You could, you could cooperate you know, closely, you could cooperate deeper. But at the end of the day, it's just about cooperation. The new agreement should put relations between European Union and Ukraine on the basis of political association and economic integration. On economic integration, it's quite clear, you know, the definition, the, the rationale behind it is, is a kind of uh, incremental and gradual, but at the end of the day, full integration of Ukraine into the common market. And common market, the EU common market, actually means uh, for, for freedoms. Freedoms uh, of, of movement of goods, services, uh, you know, investments or capitals, it doesn't matter, the point of terminology here, and of course persons. But the second point, uh, which is also of primary importance here, is about political association. And actually, in, uh, in the first part of the agreement, which uh, is already, uh, you know, uh, fully, fully agreed between the sides, between Ukraine and the EU, we are talking about enhanced political dialogue. We are talking about convergence, not purely political convergence, but also convergence in our political positions. Mm -hmm. And we are talking about values. And uh, actually, what you could find in, uh, in the Lisbon Treaty, and Lisbon Treaty uh, has uh, probably the fullest account of all the values which, uh, you know, which, which form the prerequisite for, for the European Union. The same values will be included in our association agreement. And for me, also, the idea of, of the political association is, is, is not just any kind of enhanced political dialogue because, uh, you know, the EU has enhanced political dialogue with China, for example. I'm not trying to compare us with China somehow, but it's, it's, uh, it's, it's about values and it's about conversion, not only political position, but values, the trust of political association. We are now approaching the final game of the association agreement. If we take political part, it's probably just about one key political point. It's about European perspective for Ukraine. And uh, we know that uh, also our American colleagues and friends could do a good job, it could uh, provide uh, their good services in trying to influence somehow 
a kind of, uh, I would not say negative mood back in, 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 uh, in the European Union, but still quite a careful mood. Let me probably use this word here. About, uh, about the strategic vision for future European integration. But at the end of the day, it's a critical point for Ukraine, the European perspective, as a sense of direction again, and as, as, a, as a future direction for Ukrainian reforms. Mr. Minister, if I could pick up on that, because yeah. I think you've captured, you've captured the strategic intent where this European perspective is important to you, is important to your government. The, you know, leaving behind a post-Soviet legacy and joining Europe. And I think you very correctly capture the importance, I think, of some of the negotiations. This isn't just a process of negotiating a technical key uh, with the European Union, but it actually is premised on more greater increasing convergence and, and the values side of this. So, and I also, you pointed out at the beginning with the, the reform agenda, and I think many of Ukraine's supporters uh, in this room in Washington have been struck by the breadth and scope and desire, uh, the, the range of reforms that this government is pursuing, long overdue reforms that have been stuck or where there have been no movement in the RADA. Um, now there's more legislation than ever. Many of these things are taking place. As Americans, we can appreciate um, your, your discussion about how to handle pensions is far more uh, politically advanced than our discussion about hand, how to handle Social Security. But uh, again, how do you handle the, the sense of ambivalence that you might see, particularly with your European interlocutors on this, that you aspire to Europe, you, you have this strategic intent, this vision, you're in the negotiation process. Um, there's an ability to see a whole reform agenda out there. Yet at the same time, what's happening on governance and democracy issues um, raises questions and concerns about that. How does Ukraine become more effective, more efficient at governance, at actually implementing government programs, reforming systems, pursuing these negotiations with the European Union, yet at the same time coupled with concerns about the state of civil society, media, political opposition, prosecution? How do you get that, how do you address those allegations that You've got your strategic intent right. You've actually developed a reform agenda that could be quite credible uh, for international markets and foreign investors, and yet it's being seeped, it's being uh, uh, challenged by concerns that folks have on some of the democracy issues. Uh, probably mapping out a couple of points uh, on that. Uh, the first one, of course, uh, you know, the way of reforms is definitely a difficult one. And you need a political will behind that. And you need a, a clear steering up uh, of, of, uh, of the whole reform process. The second point, of course, nobody is perfect, you know. And uh, taking a kind of comprehensive reform agenda with just uh, 20, 21 different spheres of dimension is, of course, a difficult challenge. But not taking it right away and not taking it simultaneously would mean that, you know, the basic reason, the post-Soviet uh, post legacy uh, will, be, will be still, uh, you know, quite, quite a point for Ukraine. And for me, the lack of such reforms and post-Soviet legacy was uh, the primary, uh, you know, uh, reason uh, for reacting so badly and reacting so negatively uh, by Ukraine to the economic crisis because in 2009 it was, uh, you know, citing just one important figure, minus 15% in our GDP. Right. It, it because of, of, of the total lack of reform agenda. And I'm not trying, you know, to, to analyze or criticize any, any previous go Ukrainian governments. But uh, I'm, uh, I'm actually, as, as, you've, uh, as you've cited, uh, in the foreign ministry from 1993. And for me, if the whole, even the whole idea of European integration is, is not about foreign policy choice. It's about reforms. And uh, from over, over just a year or a bit more, we see quite, quite a reform drive. Of course, again, uh, you know, on, on, on that complicated way, nobody is perfect. 
But uh, to steer up such a reform drive, you need a political will, you need political clarity, and you need a kind of political consensus. And there is a political consensus back in Ukraine, also with the president, with the, with the government, and with our parliament, uh, Rada, actually working together, also not, not citing any kind of difficult discussions, but working together on the reform agenda. And it's not about centralization, again. It's, for me, it's about political consensus and it's about political will. Probably from outside, uh, there could be a perception of a kind of centralization, but, but for me, it's again, uh, it's, it's a different perception here. Let me, I wanna allow time for a couple questions from the audience. So I'm gonna take the prerogative of the chair to ask you one more, but then catch my eye, come up to the microphone if you wanna ask a question or remaining time. Um, let me turn to the nexus of how what we've been talking about relates to relations with Russia. You've actually outlined a fairly audacious vision of a Ukraine that aspires to, to Europe. Um, and uh, all of us traveling in Ukraine understand and feel that this is a sense of, of commonality that, that exists in many government officials and those in civil society and the opposition. Um, if you think about the issues that you've been talking about, uh, from April 2010, at the time of the Kharkiv deal, uh, which was a, a controversial deal of essentially cheap gas in exchange for extending the, the Black Sea Fleet for 25 years in, in Crimea, since then the relationship has been perhaps a little bit more bumpy. Um, Prime Minister Putin's visit to Ukraine in April 2011 was an opportunity for a real discussion, a, a, a frank, in many respects, public discussion about the choices facing Ukraine in terms of the customs union with uh, Russia, Belarus, Kazakhstan, uh, the single economic space, um, and the tension you bump up against in terms of your negotiations with the European Union on the deep and comprehensive free trade agreement. And it seems pretty clear to outside observers that the president, the government, has been pretty clear. Its direction, its priority is the European Union. How do you navigate the nexus of what you're trying to achieve politically, economically, uh, in your negotiations with the European Union, as you also have knocking at the door the issue of the customs union and the single economic space? Yeah, firstly, uh, the momentum in uh, our relations with Russia is definitely there. And we need to keep up this momentum uh, because uh, we have uh, considerable potential and far from exhausted for our economic cooperation. And again, for me, it's about economic cooperation. Uh, to reiterate uh, this term here, it's of course about uh, you know the potential which has not been used for years in the Ukrainian-Russian relation, and uh, the whole dynamic of our relation probably shows it uh, quite uh, quite vigorously. The third point uh, is, of course, uh, about making choices, because uh, we, we were talking about strategic choice, uh, it's European integration, but it's also about not making foreign policy choices. For me, uh, you know, good cooperation, bona fide with Russia, does not hamper by our drive towards the European Union. And again, it's uh, two different uh, formats, two different uh, mentalities with two different substances. On the EU, EU, we are talking about political association and economic integration. The incremental uh, drive towards the common market based on full approximation of our legislation to the EU ones. With Russia, we are talking about uh, political and economic cooperation. We are talking about big projects. We are talking about uh, sectoral based approach, but we are not talking about economic integration. And uh, it's, it's quite a clear position, also a political position. You've mentioned customs union here because we are not going to ask for, for a formal membership in the customs union. But even theoretically, if, uh, if we did, even purely theoretically, you know, in order to, to reach such, such a membership, uh, we have to renegotiate all conditions of our membership in the WTO. And Ukrainian economy is quite different from the Russian ones. 
Uh, to tell you to tell you a couple of points, uh, average import tariff uh, for Ukraine is you know four plus, and for Russia at the, the end of negotiations it could be probably ten plus. But if we talk about service, uh, services, the discrepancy is uh, is even more important. Ukraine is a, is an open market in the sense of services. We have an open economy. And for example, Russia believes that uh, you know they have a critical potential for developing uh, services inside Russia, financial services. So it's about uh, it's about different uh, you know outlines, different setting ups of our economies. And again, for me, it's about strategic choice, but not making foreign policy choice. You know, to if, to cooperate effectively with Russia and uh, to proceed effectively with European integration, and I do believe we could do both quite successfully and quite effectively. Thank you, thank you. Let me turn to the audience and pick up a couple of questions at a time, given our time. Please come up uh, to the the mics um, if you're in the audience. Please come up to the mic to ask a question. These two women here, please. And if I may, given our time, I'm going to take these two questions Absolutely. together. I'll probably look free together. Okay. To make it. My name is Alexa Chapivsky. I'm a journalist. And up until a month ago, I was based in Kiev for two years. I now live here in Washington. Ukraine's stated strategic goal is to move closer towards Europe, which presumably necessitates sharing common European values. In this connection, the government of Viktor Yanukovych is vigorously prosecuting for corruption, Yulia Tymoshenko and other top level members of the opposition. Meanwhile, no top level members of the current leadership have been prosecuted. How do you respond to international critics who question the president's privatization for his personal account of a government owned estate worth tens of millions of dollars for virtually no money, and by this, of course, I'm referring to Mejahiria. How do you respond to international critics who question the so-called shady privatization of Ukra Telecom? But for now, I'd like to focus on Mejahiria. Who is paying for the construction and development of the golf course, the tennis court, the yacht club, the riding stables, the riding rink, etc.? Is this corruption, yes or no, and why? Let me pick up the second question with the woman here, please. Yes, Mary Dominic, member of the DC Bar. Um, I have a question that relates to human rights and Ukraine's relationship with the Council of Europe. Um, that very tragic case of Georgi Hanhadzi, the Ukrainian journalist who died violently, um, there's been great progress in Ukraine in very recent times, and I wondered if you could comment on that case. Thank you. In compliance with the European Court of Human Rights decision. Thank you. And let me pick up a third, given our time, sir. My name is Mubain Altan, uh, Crimean Tatar Research and Information Center. Uh, you, uh, my question is about the human rights as well, and specifically on Crimean Tatars in Crimea. You mentioned that uh, Ukraine belongs to Europe and should become a, a member uh, Euro of the European Union. And you will not have uh, a stronger support than the Crimean Tatars. Uh, the Crimean Tatars strongly support Ukraine's uh, aspiration to become a European uh, uh, Union member. However, uh, there is uh, an issue in Crimea. Crimean Tatars uh, have been uh, uh, deported from Crimea in 1944, and since for the past 67 years, they have been trying to return to Crimea. We realize that the Ukraine inherited this from the Soviet uh, era. But for the past 20 years, since Ukraine became independent, Crimean Tatars have, uh, Crimean Tatar issue problem has not been resolved. Uh, what uh, does the Ukraine, the Ukrainian government, uh, has the political will to resolve the, uh, the 67 year old Crimean Tatar human rights problem? Thank you very much. Um, Thanks, point by point, uh, on corruption. You know, corruption is uh, probably one of the most difficult underlying problems uh, for the country 
to proceed effectively with reforms. And uh, any time you are trying to detect something, you are facing corruption. And the idea is somehow to break off with the uh, <coughs> mind-blowing uh, mentality of corruption in, 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 in the Ukrainian society. But it's, uh, you know, it's of special importance uh, to break off with such mentality at, at the highest level. And just a couple of points here. Firstly, it's of course not been true that uh, only members of opposition are prosecuted for corruption. Uh, quite a number of uh, different members of, uh, uh, of, of the coalition are also under investigation. Let me just mention quite uh, famous and quite prominent case of the recent Crimean leader uh, who is under investigation for different speculation with uh, lands in Crimea. And it's not just the only case, but uh, it's, it's simply, you know, quite, quite, quite a blow. Also for Ukrainian society, seeing politicians, you know, using, uh, <laughs> and, uh, and there is always a chat about that, using extremely expensive cars, using extremely expensive clothes in there. And it's not a point uh, where such politicians could be trusted by the Ukrainian society. Uh, second point uh, about, uh, you know, presidential estate, as you've called it, uh, as, uh, well, to, according to my information, the president owns uh, quite a small bit of this estate. No, no, definitely not the whole one. And uh, I'm not aware of any developments or any kind of infrastructure developments around this estate. Uh, a good point, but again, according to the information also, uh, also which, which is known for me, if the president owns really a small bit of his estate, not, not the estate as a whole. Uh, the second point about Gongadze case, uh, you know, also for me personally, Gongadze case is uh, one of the most uh, tragic cases, uh, not for, for Ukrainian media history, but, but for Ukraine as a whole. And for me, is, uh, is you know, again, uh, it's just extremely a shame that it took such a long time to, uh, to understand and, and to make the case for, for Honkhadze. And uh, it's, it's not only for Ukraine, it's, 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 it's a kind of symbolic name here. So uh, the Council of Europe and the, and, and, and the decision of, of the court is, of course, critically important. Not also, but especially at the, uh, the backdrop of our presidency in the uh, Council of Ministers of the Council of Europe now. And, uh, you know, it's, uh, it, it's, it's, uh, it's probably one of the most important cases which uh, will be somehow coined in, 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 into the Ukrainian mentality and, and, and definitely for, uh, for the right cause. On, uh, on Crimean Tatars, uh, of course, it's, uh, it's quite a difficult issue. It's, uh, it's a difficult issue having, uh, having uh, you know, in mind its historic, uh, historic legacy. It's uh, a difficult point about reintegration. And uh, reintegration uh, is a contentious point uh, back uh, in the Crimea. But if you take, you know, the policy, if you take the thrust of the policy, uh, which is uh, implemented now by the Crimean government, is the idea of, uh, you know, continuous and sustainable reintegration of all the Tatars in, in the, into the Crimean society. And uh, if we see also the role of, of the Tatars now in, uh, in the Crimea is quite different even uh, from, from the time, let's take for probably five years ago. I, I've been uh, to the Crimea three, three weeks ago talking also to the representative uh, of the Crimean Tatars and talking about so-called EU joint initiative about Crimea and a lot of, uh, of the project within such a joint initiative are focused on the Crimea Tatars. So I believe the progress is definitely there and I could mention a number of points, a number of details, but not to burden here. Uh, all, all the auditorium. But again, the challenges are also there and we should be up to the challenges. Thank you, Mr. Minister. 
Um, I want to wrap up our conversation, unfortunately. I think we could go on for quite a while, but I just want to pick up on a couple of the themes in the conversation as we close. Um, I think the corruption issue is quite a critical one for Ukraine for its future, for its own future, but also in relationship to the goals we've talked about today. Um, I recently was part of an assessment team with David Kramer, Bob Newark, uh, Freedom House. And in, in our report that we came back with on Ukraine, we talked about corruption as, as the leading, not just a nuisance in Ukraine or an economic drag, but really the leading national security challenge to Ukraine. Um, the, th the threats today to Ukraine are not primarily external, they're actually internal. The good news about that is that I think Ukrainians have within their own control the ability to influence and determine their, their own future. But the corruption issue seems so precarious and dangerous in Ukraine because in many respects it makes uh, government officials vulnerable to manipulation from nefarious actors, whether domestic or foreign. But it also creates a disincentive for democracy. It creates a disincentive for those in power to leave power for fear of prosecution. And I think that's one of the reasons why there's been so much attention in Washington and Brussels now on what's happening with a series of, of uh, prosecution cases against uh, former government officials, opposition figures. Um, the potential that that can have on undermining and impacting uh, Ukraine's uh, European aspirations. Uh, they have to be common goals rather than contradictory goals, as you say, of what happens internally on the reform process with the foreign policy aspirations. Um, so with that, I just want to wrap up our conversation. Thank you for your time this morning. I know you've got a full day of programs uh, with your official meetings. We're glad that you were able to include this conference as part of your, part of your program. Um, thank you very much.